Retirement withdrawal strategies are crucial for sustaining a stable income flow. Understanding methods like the 4% rule, dynamic withdrawals, and bucket strategies can make a significant difference in managing retirement savings effectively. The 4% rule starts with withdrawing 4% of your savings in the first year, then adjusting for inflation annually. For instance, from a $1 million fund, you'd withdraw $40,000 initially, adjusting this amount in subsequent years to reflect inflation. Dynamic withdrawals offer more flexibility, allowing adjustments based on market performance and personal circumstances. This approach adapts your withdrawal rate to current economic conditions and financial needs. Bucket strategies involve dividing your savings into buckets based on when you'll need the funds. Each bucket is invested differently, matching the time horizon for usage. Experts suggest varying safe withdrawal rates, typically between 3.3% to 4%, depending on the strategy employed. It's important to adapt these strategies to individual retirement goals and financial situations. This overview presents a comprehensive look at effective withdrawal strategies, equipping retirees with the knowledge to manage their financial planning successfully. It's about finding the right balance for a consistent income flow through retirement. Helene, is this your area? Is this an area that you've done research on, the timing of withdrawals and how to build a strategy? Yeah, Andy, we've done a lot of research on this over the years. And I guess there's really two parts to it, right? The first part is the withdrawal rate. How much can an individual spend from their portfolio without running out of money, right? So the whole balancing of current and future needs. And that's when we come up with our dynamic spending strategy, right? Because when we looked at the 4% rule, um, that's risky in that you could either run out of money or you could have a, um, sur a surplus at the end of your life because as, as you know, everyone else I think has already mentioned, the sequence of return risk, right? So if you increase your expenses every year by inflation, no matter what, regardless of what's happening in the markets, um, like the 4% rule does, so basically ignores market performance, um, you, right, you risk running out of money or having a surplus at the end and not actually enjoying your retirement. A lot of people then look at, they say the percent of portfolio method, and they say, maybe I should just spend a percent of the portfolio each year. For a lot of retirees, they don't want the volatility that's associated with that method, right? So when we come up with that dynamic spending strategy that we use, it's really just saying, how much would someone be willing to cut their spending in down years so that if the markets go up, they could increase their spending by a little bit. So it's a little bit more intuitive about how people actually think. So you give yourself a raise if the market's doing well. If the market's not doing well, you cut back your spending a little bit. And by reinvesting whatever excess earnings you have, so say if the market's up five or eight, say the market's up eight, you could increase your year of your spending by say 5%. And reinvest that three so that in the future, if the markets go down, you don't have to cut your spending as much. So we found that that method really provides a lot of the um, stability that people need from year to year, but also the longevity that people need. So, right, they're not going to be maybe necessarily running out of money as they would be with the 4% rule. Um, but then the other piece is the withdrawal order, right? So once you know how much you can spend, how should you think about spending it, right? So a lot of people have a mix of taxable, tax deferred, and tax-free accounts. So how do you think about spending those in a way that minimizes taxes? Because tax, if, the more you pay in taxes, right, the less you have to spend on your life or the less you have to give to heirs. So we would generally you know, advise people to spend all of their non-portfolio cash flows, so the things we talked about, social security, pensions, rental income first, then any cash flows from taxable accounts, right? So interest dividends, capital gains on assets held in taxable accounts. And then finally start selling from assets in their taxable account um, which is sometimes counterintuitive, um, where people who are retired think they should spend their retirement accounts and maybe not say spend from their taxable accounts. Um, but you should really think about spending taxable accounts and then tax deferred or tax free. Um, this is like high level general speaking, but spend from your tax deferred accounts within your tax rates the lowest, right? So by doing that, um, you really, so if in the beginning of retirement, uh, you have part-time income, maybe you have a higher tax rate, you might wanna spend from your tax free accounts and save those tax deferred when you can take them out at the lowest rate. So it's really two parts. How much can I spend? And then where do I spend to minimize taxes? Um, so we found uh, following the withdrawal order that I just mentioned can add over um, 100 basis points of value, which obviously translates into either higher balances for clients or more spending over their lifetime. Thank you for that. Roger, where do you stand on the 4% rule, the benefits, the drawbacks? I like the sound of this dynamic 
spending strategy. And we know that there are radio personalities out there talking about an 8% rule. So I want to turn it to you. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a heuristic like anything, you know, and it's it's good to that, right? Whether it's 4% or dynamic withdrawal, it's taking a financial engine and fitting the person into the box to solve for lifetime income. Um, that works when you're thinking about this in an academic sense or from an institutional sense. In reality, everybody is their own iteration. And their life isn't a financial issue. So the best way to think about it is there's a, a fundamental difference between a complicated problem and a complex problem. And that's the core of what we're dealing with here when we think of rules or systems. A complicated problem can be solved. You can think through all the logistics and the complicated issues and create the algorithm and then repeat it for whoever comes down the line. A complex problem is one that there are so many other forces going in play that are interacting with each other in unexpected ways, a lot of uncertainty, that you cannot solve a complex problem. And I think that's the big distinction here. Retirement and an individual creating a great retirement, it's not complicated. It's complex. It has to be managed. A 4% rule, a dynamic withdrawal rule isn't going to solve it for an individual. Um, a, a, one easy example here is that the biggest variable in someone's retirement is not the markets, it's not inflation, it's not sequence of returns, it's their life circumstance and their preferences. Those are going to change as much or more as all of these other things, the financial stuff that we think about. And so a system that tries to solve for it in a heuristic or a model is, is really not accurate. And it's going to create anxiety. It's either going to cause them to have anxiety because they don't understand it, so they don't have confidence in it, or it's going to fit them into a box where they have to adjust their spending to the model rather than creating the life that they want. So I don't use any of that stuff in my planning, and I'm pretty adamant about it. Fritz, what's been your experience? Have your spending, like what you want and the things that you want to do, how much has that changed in the last five years? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I'm a DIY guy, unlike everybody else, but I, I'm, I'm supportive of the financial planning community because I'm, I'm pretty nerdy about this stuff and I spend a lot of time focusing on it and it's always been a personal hobby. So, but it, this is an area you've got to get right. And as you can hear right here between Colleen and Roger, there's there's differences even within the experts. Um, in our case, it's been pretty easy. I mean, we, we basically started out, I, I'm not a fan of the 4% rule increase for inflation. That's just too naive, right? If, 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 if um, the market goes down, people are going to naturally cut back their spending, right? You're going to start buying McDonald's instead of, uh, you know, the five-star steak place, whatever. So what we did is we basically set it up where every year at the end of the year, we look at our net worth, we subtract our non-sellable investments, right? The house, you've got to live somewhere, the cars. So we end up with an investable, in investing our retirement investments that we can spend for retirement. And we multiply that times three, three and a half and 4%. And that kind of gives us our guardrails. We know what our spending is approximately going to be. Obviously, inflation can be a surprise. But if the market's done well and we don't really need to spend more, well, we can kind of reduce our withdrawal rate. And, and we do it every year in January, once a year. And we just automatically set it up. You, you've always had a paycheck, right? In retirement, you don't have a paycheck. So we've just automated everything where it transfers out of a dedicated money market fund that we've set up for this purpose. Based on that math at the end of the year, we just automatically transfer money into our checking account. And we know if it's in our checking account, we can spend to know that we can spend what's in the checking account. We don't have to sit there and run a budget. We know that if it's in the checking account, it's within our safe withdrawal rate. So it, it really works well. It's reduced the anxiety. And having that variability on the spending, the to Colleen's point, it, it lets us move our withdrawal rate up if the markets come down so we don't have to cut all of our spending out but we still are realistic about, hey, there's still got to be a ceiling on how high can you take your withdrawal rate before you're getting into a riskier area. So having just a formula that shows you the range and then deciding on what's going to work and set that up as an automated paycheck has worked really well for us. That's very practical advice. And good to see that real world practice is effective in working well for you. And can you talk a little bit about like, 4% rule, withdrawal rates. This seems something that Gen Z and millennials 
probably don't need to be thinking about? Or, or is that not the case? What should they be thinking about or what do they need to understand about retirement so that when the time comes, they're ready? So in the interest of full disclosure, I have to say I co-authored a paper in 2013 called Breaking the 4% Rule that, that advocated for designing a, a dynamic uh, withdrawal rate uh, that was designed to help you get to 100, hypothetically, uh, and, and spend down your balance to zero. So we got super geeky about that, too. But I think I think for I don't agree with the 4% rule. I think, um, you know, any heuristic model is going to be wrong sometimes. So you can't overly focus on this is the right answer because, you know, the other real wild card is how long are you going to live? You just don't know. Right. So, you know, one thing I tell people is there's no right answer here. You can't solve the problem mathematically because there are too many variables, as Roger said, to be able to control. And everybody has a different set of risk preferences and sort of personal circumstances and walks into their post-retirement world with a different mix of guaranteed and non-guaranteed income sources, right? So everybody's different. Um, for Gen Zs and millennials, though, the the most useful thing about the 4% rule, which while it's not right for anybody, is also not wildly wrong either, is it's just a really good rule of thumb to say, look, this is probably not exactly what you should do or will do. But if you're trying to figure out how much money you should be aiming to save, right? It's a percentage of your income as you save and a, a uh, factor by 5, 10, 20% uh, times, right? As you get older of your annual income that you need to build in order to maintain that lifestyle. So I do think it's really helpful just as a, a, a framing exercise to think about because it's pretty straightforward and simple and doesn't involve a lot of variables. Um, I think that's a, I think that's a great point, Anne. It's like walking towards a mountain. When you're really far away, just head towards the mountain. Exactly. And right. I, I want to go that way. Yeah. When you get there, right, you got to pick your exact path. You may go up and go down. I love that analogy. But just go in the right direction, right? And I think for twenty and thirty somethings, right, just start, invest the money. Don't worry about it too much. Uh, given my former role as a target date manager, I think those are great investments, but like get it invested appropriately for your age. Make sure either you rebalance it or somebody else rebalances it and stop worrying. Just do it. Let it go. Great advice. Let's move to segment four. 